Real Stories Tapes True Crime is your new true crime podcast fix. In our first season, we'll explore suspicious deaths at a California hospital and a skydiver landing dead on a suburban driveway with a bag containing guns, drugs, and night vision goggles. To join our investigation, search and subscribe to Real Stories Tapes True Crime on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. There are so many more innocent people in prison than people realize. They arrested me in front of my bed on my bench. When I got arrested, I kept on saying I was innocent. What are you doing? What are you doing? It's not fair that he had to stand in that courtroom and accept guilt for something that he didn't do. There's no physical evidence linking him to this crime. And there was absolutely no investigation. Nobody cares that you did not commit that crime. No one believed me. He shouldn't have been in jail for 34 years. You gotta let him go. That's not him. Free to go, thank you very much. In the early 90s, American criminal defense attorneys created a network of international associations called the Innocence Network. I'm free now, it's been 30 years. Their mission, to fight injustice by exonerating innocent people and helping the justice system correct its mistakes. This is a worldwide human rights movement. Anybody can be mistakenly identified. And how many times do we have to see this? I really don't know what they said to release me. Today, I filed a motion to null cross or dismiss the charges against Lewis Fogel. What are you looking forward to the most? Until the judge says you are absolutely free, there's always nervousness that it's going to go wrong. And you have to trust that's going to go well, uh, but you don't know. For many convicts who claim to be a victim of a miscarriage of justice, these attorneys are their last chance, their last resort. It felt so good actually having people that believe in my innocence. I couldn't do this without them. I thought I was going to die in jail. I believe that one day we're going to come and say, you know, we made a mistake, we were wrong. You know, I kept fighting for my freedom for 34 years. I would have never believed this stuff is true. Not until you live it. He wrote to them. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Dear Innocence Project, I'm serving life for a homicide and rape that I'm innocent to. I'm completely innocent of this crime. I wouldn't waste her time if I wasn't innocent. This nightmare has been going on almost 17 years for me. Please help end this injustice. <laughs> I would be very grateful if you could help me to get the DNA test ran to prove that I am innocent. He's written that to us, you know, and it went from 17 years to 20 years to 25 years to 30 years. <sighs> I thank you for your time, he says. It's just cr that's crazy. You're free to go. Thank you very much. Since the early 90s, attorneys from the Innocence Network have freed 372 wrongfully convicted people in the U.S. thanks to advances made in DNA science. 20 of them were on death row. Together, these former detainees spent 4,563 years in prison for crimes they did not commit. Think about how you would go through this. Like, would you be able to survive that experience? It's it's the best it's the best job in the world. I think um, I think the problem with this job is it never feels like enough. The reasons behind these wrongful convictions are often similar. They are mostly false testimonies. 
confessions extracted under duress, improper forensics, and for the vast majority, eyewitness misidentification. This is what happened to the detainee whose story you will discover today. I'm sure, you know, he was walking in that little walk, I had no idea that he wouldn't walk free again. It just blows my mind when I think about that. What do you mean he got to stay in there for the rest of his life? He said, yay. So he can't never come out? He can't never come out. It was awful. It was the worst conversation I've ever had with a client. Being innocent, was not enough. Being innocent was not enough. And maybe that's, that's how maybe we ought to, ought to style this. Being innocent was not enough. George Toka claims to be a victim of a miscarriage of justice. Emily Ma and Kristen Wenstrom work at IPNO, Innocence Project New Orleans in Louisiana. They agreed to defend him. This is their story. Louisiana is the state with the highest incarceration rate and the largest number of prisoners sentenced to life without parole. It's one of 31 states where the death penalty still exists. 83 of those convicted are presently on death row, and six were executed in the last 20 years. IPNO, Innocence Project New Orleans, was created specifically for these reasons. Emily Ma, an English lawyer, has managed the association since 2003. Kristen Wenstrom joined in 2007. IPNO has already freed 27 wrongfully convicted prisoners. 10 of these clients were teenagers when they were arrested, as was George Toka, AKA Chicken. The case dates back to 1984. On the 23rd of April, 1984, there had been a dance at the Superdome, and George Toker was one of the people who went to the Superdome, and so was his best friend, Eric Batiste. I was too young to go at that time. So they went to the dance, and um, story has it that everybody went their separate ways. George had a little girlfriend, and so George left the dance uh, with his girlfriend, trying to find a motel to take her to, and Eric left with some friends. And then about 5.30, 6 o'clock the next morning, Eric and the person he was with tried to rob a couple um, at a gas station uptown in New Orleans. And Eric approached the car and asked the couple if they had change or something like that. And then the person he was with came up behind him and pulled a gun and demanded the keys. Um, and following that, there was um, some kind of fight between one of the passengers of the car and, and Eric Batiste. And the boy who had the gun shot in the direction of the passenger who was fighting with Eric Batiste. Eric was shot in the temple or in the side of the head and died immediately. Eric was dead. And I know Eric, man, my brother would never kill Eric, you know? They were brothers. They was brothers, you know, and nothing couldn't tear them apart. A few hours after the murder, the investigation began, and very quickly, the police turned to George, making him the sole suspect. A police officer, Marlon DeFillo, recognized the name Eric Batiste, and he knew that George Toka was his good friend. And this particular police say, well, I know who it is. I know who did it. That's Eric Batiste's land right there. And wherever there's Eric, there's George. There's Chicken George. You know, and that's usually the case. That's usually the case. And so George Toko immediately became a suspect. The woman and the man who were the intended victims of the armed robbery picked George's photograph out of a photo array. And that was it. That was all the evidence against him. The only evidence against George Toka was the eyewitness identification of two strangers who had previously only seen a, a photograph of his head. 
Yet a few hours earlier, the couple who were victims of the attempted robbery had been questioned at the police station. Both the man and woman independently gave a precise and similar description of the person who fired the shot, a description that did not fit Chicken George at all. They described it, you know, somebody who was six foot tall or um, an older and had a deep, husky voice. And, but the photograph that the police showed um, was only of George's head. So you could not tell how tall he was or how big he was or how old he looked compared to the other, um, the other boy. And in that statement, teeth didn't have no goals on it, you know, and clearly they can see you know, and chicken tea is kind of, you know, a little out there, so you can't miss them. And they got goals on them. That's not something you can miss, you know, and you can't take them off. On April 25th, 1984, without investigating any further, the police arrested George Toka at his home for the murder of his best friend. He was 17 at the time. Man, that kills me. I mean, I watched it just a, a couple of days ago and it and it made me tear up because he looks, I mean, he is so young and so innocent. And he, this wide-eyed look of like, what is going on? You know, it's, you can really feel that because that is that point. That was the day where he went from being a pretty normal 17-year-old to never having freedom again. That was that moment, you know, that was captured on TV. And it's like, yeah, it kills me. When he was arrested for this, when he was really a child, he was only 17 years old. He was a person who was definitely deserving of a different fate in life than the one he had, he had received. And I'm sure, you know, he was walking in that little walk. I had no idea that he wouldn't walk free again. It just blows my mind when I think about that. No, no. No, no, nobody could believe that. Nobody. And I'm sure at that time, Eric, Eric, mama, grandmother, brothers, none of them, they didn't believe none of that. They didn't believe chicken would do that. When his trial started on April 15th, 1985, George Toka had already spent almost a year in prison, 356 days. He had just turned 18. The charges had not changed. They were still solely based on the couple's testimony, the victims of attempted robbery. And even if George didn't match the description they had given on the day of the murder, they both confirmed their accusation by pointing to him during the trial. See that boy in the courtroom? The one that said, get out of the car, I'm going to Just for you. Yes, sir. All right, where is he seated? Where is he wearing? See it over to the right, right over here. This individual here? Yes. So he was going through losing his best friend, his family, to then suddenly being accused of being responsible for it. George's lawyer had just recently stopped being a prosecutor and didn't really understand how to investigate um, the possibility that it was not George Toker who did this crime. On April 16, 1985, after a trial lasting 10 days, a verdict was reached. The sentence was final. So all as we now, April 16, 1985, we the jury find the defendant guilty of second degree murder. Exactly a year from the date that the crime occurred, April 23rd, 1985, he was sentenced to life without parole. And George was sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of parole, probation, or suspension of sentence. Which means in Louisiana, you die in prison. I was like 12, 12, 13 years old. And I'm staying in life. What do you mean he got to stay in there for the rest of his life? He said, yay. So he can't never come out? He can't never come out. And I didn't know how to take that. Because he, he just was, you know, he was my brother, but he was my, you know, he was my daddy, my father in the house. You know, who took care of everybody in the house. Being innocent w was not enough. 
being innocent was not enough. On April 16, 1985, George was sent to Angola, which at the time was the biggest and most violent penitentiary in Louisiana. The first year, George hoped, like many wrongfully convicted, that the law would recognize its mistake and release him. When he realized this wouldn't happen, he decided to make the most of the few benefits jail had to offer a young man from a poor neighborhood, education. George, like most teenagers arriving there, was very, very vulnerable. It took him a while, I think, to focus, because he was a kid when he got there. But once he did, he became very singularly focused on getting a GED, which is a high school equivalency certificate. He studied horticulture, and he studied um, car repairs, and he studied pesticide application, and he studied sign language because he felt that it would be good to learn sign language. He just tried to do everything he could and um, eventually obtaining a four years uh, bachelor's degree in uh, Baptist Seminary. George was not uh, the most gifted student by any means. He didn't have the, the foundation that a lot of students do going through school. He had dropped out of school and earning that, he had to work very hard. But the thing that impressed me with George is he had a hunger to learn and he was eager to learn. He never gave up. He would continually try. Even if he didn't do well on a test or a paper, you know, he gave it his all. And for me, that, that makes all the difference. He went from being a high school dropout you know, before he was arrested to finishing an associate's and then a bachelor's degree in prison. You know, he never stopped educating himself while he was in there. I was there when he graduated and um, we were very proud of George and he was so proud of himself, as he should be. It's really, really amazing to see that. Over the years, the lost teenager became a studious young man. Even before graduating, George had gained enough confidence to believe in proving his innocence one day. He was able to celebrate his graduation with Emily and Kristen in 2010, thanks to a letter he had sent nine years earlier to the Innocence Project New Orleans, which was then just starting up. When he sent his letter in 2001, he had already spent 17 years in prison. Where I would like to explain what I have been wrongfully convicted of, this letter gives a good account of the facts of my case. I'm completely innocent of the crime. I wouldn't waste a time if I wasn't innocent. Simply because I was a close friend of that person who was killed during the crime, I am serving a life sentence in Angola. My friend's family fully believes in my innocence of their son's murder and is ready to help any way they can. This nightmare has been, has been going on almost 17 years for me. God. <laughs> Please help end this injustice. I'll await a reply back. Good work on all of the cases that you are working on. F, thank you and keep fighting for justice. Yours truly, George Tucker. Yeah. After receiving this letter, the Innocence Project New Orleans agreed to take on George's case. And when Emily took over as head of the association in 2003, George was her first client. By then, he had already spent 19 years in prison. We investigated that case for two or three years. Really what we did is we listened to our client, um, and he told us what happened and um, what he knew, and we talked to his friends and uh, his family and the family of Eric Batiste to get more information. So, you know, we did this investigation that George's attorney didn't do at the time. Kristen and Emily were helped in their investigation by Calvin Johnson, a retired judge who supports the Innocence Project whenever he can. All three very quickly discovered that the family of the victim, Eric Batiste, had been supporting George since the day of the crime and believed in his innocence. However, at the time of the trial, the family had not been questioned. So Emily, Kristen, and Calvin Johnson agreed to question them. I've been given permission by the family to speak for the family. And uh, what I want you to really know is that we're really, really upset that someone was charged with uh, the killing of Eric that was really innocent. As a family, my mother, his mother, and the entire family know, we know deep down in our heart, that George did not kill Eric. 
And I think a great ingest has been done towards George. And we really, the whole family, would love to see the release of George. Because until George is free, we cannot finalize my nephew Eric Baptiste's debt because we have to deal with it every year that it makes another year that George is serving time for something he didn't do. Just renews the hurt of the day that we heard that Eric had been killed. And we just would like to see him free. And so I'm asking you, please, please, I'm pleading that this injustice would be corrected. We went um, several times with the victim's family to talk to the district attorney about the case over the years, and they pleaded with the district attorney to, you know, they knew he, George didn't do it, and to please uh, let him out. George totally thought, that ought to be enough for me to get out of this, but it wasn't. Eric's family was not even notified of the trial against George. The prosecutors did not notify Eric's family, and George's lawyer, did not understand why they could have been important at the trial and didn't contact them or notify them that it was going on. During their investigation, Emily and Kristen uncovered every single flaw in George's 1985 defense. While interviewing people who were with him on the night of the murder, they very quickly discovered the name of a young man who supposedly confessed at the time. If the lawyer had asked some basic questions, some basic questions of George in the community where George lived, or of Eric Batiste's family, I think he would have very quickly come to learn the name of the real perpetrator in this case, who was Edison. We found all of this evidence um, by primarily talking to witnesses. And the last everyone had seen of Eric Batiste was he was with Edison. And Edison fits the description of the gunman perfectly. Um, and we also talked to people who were close friends with Edison, who at the time, and who say that he confessed um, to them about having accidentally shot his friend, Eric. We know who really did the crime. And it's not simply that George Toker doesn't match the descriptions given by the only two eyewitnesses to this crime. They in no way match George Toker in every specific that they give, other than that he was a black male, but they do in every way match the person who has multiple times uh, confessed to the crime and who um, uh, was the last person seen alive with the victim. In 2010, Kristen and Emily were ready to present their new information and to call a dozen witnesses in order to submit a motion to appeal for a trial revision. This hearing was in fact only the first stage in a long legal process, which is much more taxing and long-winded in Louisiana than in any other state. Emily and Kristen knew that if they failed at this hearing, they would extend the duration of the process. But in 2010, George had already spent 26 years in prison. When we had a hearing in 2010, where we were, as I said previously, just arguing about whether he had a right to make his innocence claim at all. We presented sort of a final argument using the demonstratives and things like that. Um, I believe the pleadings that we had filed in front of the judge with the exhibits stacked up to probably, I mean, something about this high <laughs> of paper, right? You know, two, a couple of reams worth of paper. And the judge um, heard the arguments and then went into chambers and came back 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later. I don't remember it being particularly well, it long. Was, anyway, I'm not sure it was even that long. So we all stepped outside for a moment. Then he came back in and um, he issued his ruling. Um, and uh, that was that was it. <laughs> I mean, he kind of went through the history of the case a bit, um, which made it sound a bit official. <laughs> and then essentially said, if I remember correctly, that he really didn't find any of the witnesses credible and therefore was denying George the opportunity to present the merits. He found reasons to disbelieve. We had like 10 witnesses in there, didn't we, over the day? Um, every single one of them, which is quite extraordinary because of course, you know, somebody could be exaggerating or somebody could be mistaken. But the idea that like 10 different people or however many it was would come in 
and commit perjury for someone who has no power to do anything for them whatsoever. It's really quite astonishing and it's a pretty worrying attitude that the representatives of the state of Louisiana have. But for me, the thing that really upset me and I went out into the hallway and cried was that statement by the assistant district attorney is sort of freeing one of their own and the general um, disrespect towards our, to the witnesses. I mean, these, like we said, these are people that had nothing, no reason to lie for George whatsoever. Anything, they were friends with uh, Edison. Like they were somebody that would have a reason to protect their friend. Um, and to hear people just essentially say, well, they're poor black people, so we shouldn't believe them. I found incredibly upsetting. And then of course the worst part is you say goodbye and you watch him walk down a metal corridor, you know, with, you know, bars <laughs> and um, steel and cement um, and you get in your car and drive away. And, um, you know, once you get to know somebody and you feel like friends, it's a, it's a terrible feeling. It doesn't make any sense why they have to go back to that and I get to go home, you know, and sleep in my comfortable bed and, you know, do whatever I want. <laughs> The reason George's case is particularly hard is because, uh, because being innocent is not a, a legal reason to be able to get out of prison in Louisiana, unless you have DNA testing. But most people don't have DNA testing. You know, your hopes go up and then they come down, because Innocent Project, but they were on the ball. They really were, and I appreciate everything they did. Every time they, you know, came up with new evidence and appealed it, it was shut down. It was just like, how can that be so? How can that be so? It's so hard because this case was so clear, so clearly innocent, and his yeah, his legal claims were so difficult and were probably going to fail. Um, it's just, just really dreadful. It's, it's just it just goes to show how completely disassociated the law is with like what's what's real and factual and just. One year later. Kristen and Emily tried again in front of a different judge. This time, their motion for an appeal for revision was granted. It was good news, but the attorneys knew that the next stage in this lengthy legal marathon would only take place after at least two years, and if they lost a year at every stage, George could be detained for decades. So Emily and Kristen followed other leads at the same time. In 2014, they learned that the Supreme Court wanted to backdate a recently signed law prohibiting life sentences for minors. So the attorneys suggested George's case set a precedent. We always just do everything we can for our clients because we want to get them out of prison, even if it's not the full exoneration, you still want to bring someone home to their family. Um, and so we thought that we should just file that challenge. And then to our great surprise, the US Supreme Court agreed to hear George's case. That is when, uh, when that case was pending in the US Supreme Court, um, the district attorney made uh, George Toker an offer um, to get out of prison. On January 25th, 2015, the state attorney general approached Emily with a radical plea for George. While for 14 years, the work and the battle readiness of the Innocence Project New Orleans might not have been enough to obtain a revision of the trial, and perhaps never would, it had, however, alerted and annoyed the legal authorities enough to finally decide to put a complete stop to this case. So on January 26, 2015, Emily presented the attorney general's plea to George. If he agreed to sign a confession for the murder of his best friend, he would be released immediately. When presented with the plea, George had already been in prison for 30 years. We went to him and, and talked to him about it, and that was, um, it was the worst conversation I've ever had with a client. By agreeing to a plea, he recognized that he was giving up his innocence claim. He was giving up a possibility of, of some kind of compensation for the years he'd been in jail. He was giving it all up. It was a very hard decision for George. It was really hard for him to do. He did not want to plead guilty. So George had to make the decision then, do I accept this or do I stay in jail 
while my case flows through the legal system, do I stay in jail? Well, he called me one day, you know, and he cried. He cried because he didn't want to. He didn't want to. And I know why he didn't want to, you know. I know he didn't want to. And I, I told him, you know, it's, it's your life. You know, I can't, none of us can't be in that jail with you, in that cell block with you. We don't know what you go through day in and day out, you know. 30 years in jail was enough. To stay another day was a day too many. Being in a maximum security prison every day is, is a, well, the next day is never promised. You're in a maximum security prison and bad things happen to people in maximum security prisons. And that's, that, that was a part of his reality and a part of the reasons I think he made the decision he made. On January 29th, 2015, after 30 years in prison, George accepted the deal, pleading guilty for the murder of his best friend in exchange for immediate release. When the judge asks, "Are you you accept this plea, or you're um, you're guilty of this crime?" Things like George had to say yes. You know, he had, and I I knew that was going to be incredibly hard for him. So I was, I could feel my heart pounding, my <laughs> the little kind of like lump in your throat. He got up there, and uh, the judge asked him, you know, was he okay with this plea and all these different things. And he dropped his head and he cried. And he shook his head, yeah. You know. The whole courtroom was silent and uh, and, and wrapped with attention. And because um, it's not fair that he had to sit stand in that courtroom and accept guilt for something that he didn't do. It's not fair that he had to say all of that to be free when he shouldn't have been there in the first place. It's just Fortunately, the system isn't fair. Everyone in the courtroom was crying, crying because I think everyone recognized how hard a decision it was that a person who didn't commit a crime is now admitting to something else that he didn't do, but is doing it to get out of jail. Because he agreed to this, he get to, you know, get out today. It was, like I said, mixed emotion. I, I felt really hurt from having to do that and excited at the same, you know, same time that I was actually getting out of Angola. George went to prison at 17. He was released at 47. All his relatives were there to witness his first steps into his new life. So we all just drove up there, and then we just stand outside the gates. <laughs> and we see him get out, and he talks to one of the guards, and then, you know, he makes his way out, and he looks so young, right? When I walk out of Angola that night, and saw my mom and stuff, and my family and everybody, you know, I knew that, you know, wow, I'm finally free after all these years. You know, he really getting out. We were all happy, you know, everybody crying and hugging each other. I'm feeling real blessed and uh, excited that uh, my mom was still living and was there. And... It was wonderful to see him walk into the arms of his family. Um, very special. George's sisters particularly have been very vocal advocates for him ever since he was arrested. Uh, many people who are in prison for, for 10, 15, 20, 30 years don't hear from their family anymore. You know, after a while, family just drops off. They all just, you know, one big giant hug, all, all of them around him, and um, we got to hug his mom. And, and then, you know, he made his way over to us, and we all hugged him and wished him well. My lawyer, Miss Emily, we definitely have forged a friendship. You know, over the years, and uh, again, you know, she's not only my attorney, but she's also a friend. And you know, all of them are friends, and they've all been so supportive of me. Even though it was dreadful watching George realize that he wasn't coming home the way he wanted to, I also knew <laughs> that he would just be so happy to be home and have that all behind him. So, of course, it was incredibly joyful. I wouldn't feel like, like I wanted to, but I was, I was free and actually leaving 
you know, um, that hell hole, you know, for, uh, for after so many years. Before it's been after 30 years, I'm missing these great New Orleans tradition. It's still good. They're, they're delicious. It's great to not have to wake up, you know, and be in a controlled environment and be told what to do, you know, what not to do, and you know, and, and having, having control back over your life again is is, is wonderful. I got home. I, I couldn't hardly sleep. I didn't for, for the first two weeks. I was I was out. I, I barely got any sleep. Uh, just excited. Uh, just, you know, just drilling and running and. I uh, just wanted to get back out in, in the streets and, and outside and just you know, hang out and ride around. And... After 30 years of isolation, George Toka had to adapt to a dramatically different world. And to make the most of this new independence, George had to ask his sister for help. As far as driving, he had to learn how to drive. So he used my car and I had to teach him how to drive. <laughs> Well, my first time uh, driving after coming out of prison after so many years, it, it, was, a, it was a frightening experience. It was, I was nervous. You know, they drive uh, much faster now than they did 30 years ago. As he, you know, I watch him and he on the highway and he, you know, going like 10 miles per hour. Uh, she was telling me I'm driving too slow. Uh, you know, don't be nervous, uh, you know. And that's the chicken. You got to speed up, you know, you got to. He said, oh, oh, okay, wait, wait, hold on, hold up, hold up, hold up. A lot of people tell me I was driving like an old, old man, so I had to start driving a little faster. But uh, I'm getting over, I'm gonna do a lot of my, my nervous, nervousness now. I'm more comfortable not driving. George lost 30 years of his life. Years he tried to make up for behind the steering wheel, but also by looking through family photos, a family he was deprived of for so long, but who never gave up on him. My brother, my lord, my oldest brother, Joseph, and his wife. Man, I love this picture, yeah. My little nephew, George, that's Paula's last kid. Uh, she named after me, little George Token. Nice. And I, they were very supportive, I really. I wouldn't have made it without them. I mean, without, without family and friends, coming in and encouraging you and showing that they love you and giving you hope. Um, you know, I don't think I would have made it. You know, now he's just trying to get back to living life. He, you know, every day is a struggle for him. It is, but I think he loves it. I think so. He has like a whirlwind of energy to do well. I mean, he's so excited to be out of prison and to have all these opportunities to, to show people what he is and to make money and to have a family and to do whatever it is he wants to do. It changes every five minutes, but he is so, so excited. And so because he has that will and that energy, I think he's going to be all right. Um, he has a lot of people that want him to do well. So. And today, <laughs> George is out, and man, I, I wasn't sure how he was going to handle freedom. <laughs> um, not because I doubted him, but just this, the world has changed so much. But man, like, he was talking business plans and, you know, getting the tools together that he needed to start his business and, and you know, immediately making contacts with people, um, setting up clients. I mean, within a week of being out, he was doing all of that. It was wonderful. I was like, I don't know how you know how to do all this. I would have just be, I'd just sit in a room and kind of bask in the technology or whatever, or like, or the freedom or stand outside under the open sky for a while. But he was like, let's go, you know? By signing the plea bargain presented by the court, George accepted to never be officially found innocent for his best friend's murder and never to receive any compensation. So straight after his release at 47, George only had one aim, 
to work for survival and for independence, but mostly for him to be able to help his loved ones. And barely nine months after his release, he successfully set up his own horticulture business, of which he is the sole but happy employee. And he continues to develop plans and strategies to raise funds and increase his customer base. It's difficult being an ex-offender, uh, you know, in, in today's society, so, uh, and really earn a living, you know, a decent living. So I have to be very uh, ambitious and very, you know, uh, dedicated to try to work hard and to try to uh, earn a decent living, you know, and, to, and work and, and build my own business because I want to be my own boss. I just want to be treated, you know, fairly. So I, I, I'm, uh, I use this, then I come back and make another, you know, another thing. Shovel About shovel? Oh, yeah, need There's a shovel. shovel OK. All right. Even if he did commit a crime, uh, I would still hire him. So that's not a consideration for me, because I think we all make mistakes, you know, and, and forgiveness is important. But in George's case, it's really horrifying because he was innocent. He lost 30 years of his life, and then he's coming out and, you know, and trying to reestablish his life. And, you know, to lose most or half of your adulthood to imprisonment means it's like you're getting out and you're starting all over again. And that's really difficult. So, but then I'd also say, as by, those are my beliefs, but it's also important to me to have someone who's a hard worker and who's going to do a good job. And I met George, and he is an extremely hard worker. He's kind and he's friendly, and he does beautiful work. I think, as you'll see in my garden. So, he's you know straightforward. He has goals, has plenty goals, and I love it. But sometimes I think he feel like he gonna lose his freedom. So he's trying to do everything in one day. You know, like if tomorrow ain't gonna, you know, if he wake up, you know, this, this, this beautiful dream will be over. So, you know, he tries to do 50 different things in one day. Uh, as, a, as a child and as a young teen, I was just sitting in a cell uh, with a life sentence. So I never really had a chance to really enjoy it life. Aside from his professional plans, to be able to fully enjoy life, George would like nothing more than to finally start a family. But at 47, and after 30 years in prison, making new friends and dating is clearly more complicated than at 17. It, I mean, it just, it, it has its drawbacks, you know, and, and when, you know, trying to rebuild, it's not, it's not easy all the time, trying to explain that to people. It's hard for, you know, when I, when I, when I share my story with women, about being, just coming out of prison, you know, but, but they want to know why, why I don't have any children, why I don't, you know, it's something I don't really like. I'm not comfortable with, I have to share right off the, you know, from the beginning, because, you know, it kind of, you know, uh, make, the, make the, the encounter a little more intense than, you know, dealing with people, so, for the first time. So, yeah. Hopefully, and I, I think hopefully, pretty soon I may meet someone, a special lady in my life. And as, the, as we say in the um, in children's uh, stories, maybe he will be able to say, at some point in his life, he lived happily ever after. It feels great. I mean, it's it's let you know that let you know that you're free, and I'm really free, finally free. Um, you know, it's not like a, in prison in a cell where, you know, you have to, the guard have to let you in and let you out. So, but it's, ex it's exciting to have, you know, have a place of my own, you know, for the first time. And then a week ago, he came into our office. <laughs> Ta-da, he smiles and his golds are gone. You know, the gold, the gold uh, style of fashion is, is, is gone, you know, it's, it's not in anymore. You know, this was, this, this, was, this was cool. They were just cool back then, and for many years they were cool, but the natural teeth really is in now. It's the, more, it's the fashion. I just, I just want to be, you know, in, in a new fashion, you know, just up, up, up to date with everything. I don't want to be old-fashioned, so I want to be, you know. When I got arrested, I kept on saying I was innocent. What are you doing? What are you doing? You got to let him go. 
that's not him. I kept right fighting for my freedom for 34 years, you know, uh, after so many letdowns. I believe that one day they would come and say, you know, we, we made a mistake, we were wrong, and, uh, and, and let me go. The thing about Innocence Project is they're more than just attorneys. It's their family and friends because one of the things about them, even after they get us released and exonerated, they don't just disappear and go on to the next case. I don't even, you know, look at them as lawyers and, you know, I look at them as people that I can call in the middle of the night and, you know, cry and laugh. And that's what makes them different. That's what, you know, makes them stick out, you know, 